reading from the ESV, 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12 through chapter 11, verse 3. This is the word of God. Not that we dare to compare or classify ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. But we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. For we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you, for we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond limit in the labor of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. I wish you would bear with me in a little foolishness. Do bear with me, for I feel a divine jealousy for you, since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. But I am afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. And may God add his blessing to the public reading of scripture. Amen. I grabbed. <laughs> nice try. <laughs> nice try, brother. No fretting. All right, let's, let's pray and we'll look into God's word. Lord, today we do just come to you and as frail humans, as people who are dependent on you, as ones who come to your word and want to grow and abound in Christ and have all that you have for us in Jesus Christ, as ones who want to bring our speculations and our biases and our presuppositions and have you adjust us to the word of God so that we can love one another better so that we can have koinonia, which brings your heart joy. You long for us to be united together. And then also help us to submit to your word, to know how to apply the word of God to the people that we live amongst, our co-workers and our neighbors and our kids and their kids and their friends and, and the people in the grocery store, Lord. We desire to be, make an impact for the gospel and for your kingdom. And we know that your kingdom relates in relationship and so we ask that you would help us and we most of all are dependent on the power of the Holy Spirit who's been given to us to will and to do your good pleasure through us and so Lord have your way with us today and the best we know how we open up our hearts and our minds to you and we submit them to the word of God in Jesus name amen amen well I've titled this spiritual measurements Paul is continuing to help us thrive and measure spiritual ministry the way the Lord Jesus Christ intended. We need to be reminded that we have an enemy, a wicked foe, Satan, who is full of deceit but has ultimately been defeated. Paul reminds and encourages these saints to go onward in faith, confidence, and dependence upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul here reminding us that last week we talked about spiritual warfare and we talked about being in the flesh and not being in the flesh. And so Paul is working with this church. There is some outside influence in this church, the Judaizers, who are bringing a real misunderstanding of Scripture who are confusing these believers, who are creating a competition and a comparing and a contrasting. They more are interested in the outside than the inside. There's also a few, some within the midst of the Corinthians who are kind of stiff-arming Paul and are questioning his authority as an apostle. And Paul graciously is trying to shepherd this body in a way like Jesus in meekness, and in gentleness, 
but would not, at the same time, not usurping the authority and the calling that he has given him as an apostle. And so he is going to come, and he is going to deal with that false teaching, and he is going to deal with some skirmishes, but he desires to leave room for the Spirit of God and for the Word of God to do a work in these life. And so now he is going to break in, and he's continuing in that warfare thought, and here he's going to actually talk about comparing, contrasting, and competition can lead to inflating self. And that's what he's talking about when he comes to verse 12. For we are not bold to class or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves. The thought there is they push themselves up to the front to be spotlighted, to be seen. That's actually happening. That's not, there's no part of that in the kingdom of God. No part of that at all. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. And we are called to not push ourselves to the front. And so Paul here is dealing with that. But they, when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are without understanding. We are not to compare ourselves with other people or contrast ourselves or compare ourselves to ourselves. But our, our example is Jesus Christ and the word of God. And so Paul is reminding them of this. I love the passage in Romans 12, 16. It says, be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. And so Paul's dealing with these Judaizers who think they have profound wisdom and it's frustrating the Corinthians who already have a bent to actually elevating the intellect over God through speculations because it's the culture that they live in. Does that sound familiar? That's our culture. So this is really practical for us as we deal with each other, as we deal with the warfare that we're in, and as we deal with being effective as salt and light in the world. And so Paul here says that you are being unwise if you do that. The thought there is you are just casting aside knowledge. You're just flinging away that, and you're really just absolutely inflating yourself, and that isn't wisdom at all. It's unwise. Here's why. Because you can always find someone to look at to make yourself feel better or worse. Isn't that not true? If, if that's just human nature that we do that. And so these Judaizers are coming in, they're underneath the law, they believe that they have to work the law to, be, to earn righteousness before God. This immature church is struggling with that doctrine. And so they're beginning to compare and contrast themselves. Maybe I'm not, maybe I am, maybe I'm this. Why is that person doing this? Why is that person doing that? And they have immediately taken their eyes off of Christ and off of what Paul has taught them, and now it's just leading to unwise behavior. It is much easier to judge based off of externals, but we are not to focus there, but on the heart and an internal transformation. Well, Paul here in 12 is kind of trying to recenter them, trying to get kind of against them and say, listen, Remember what I had said earlier that you're supposed to focus on the unseen, not the seen. We need to be retrained as believers to more focus on what we can't see and the spiritual and being led by the Spirit of God who we can't control. He controls us. And so I, I love what Troy said. That scripture, or um, was it Troy that said, be being filled with the Holy Spirit, that we're called to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. These Judaizers who are coming in from the outside are being controlled by their own carnality, their own flesh. And verse 12 proves it because they're comparing and they're contrasting and they're comparing and they're becoming wise in their own estimation. It also creates a competition. And that's what we pick up on this verse is this competition. Paul says, I don't need a letter of commendation. I don't need to push myself forward. Remember in verse, in chapter 3, Paul talked about this. I just, just want to read this 
because it calls us back to this. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again, or do we need as some letters of commendation to you or from you? You are our letter. It's the fruit of the ministry that's the proof of the ministry. You are our letter. In our hearts, known and read by all men, being manifested that you are a letter of Christ. Christ, it came from Christ. Not from Paul's effort, not from Paul coming, from the power of Christ, cared for by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. Not on tablets of stone, which these Judaizers are proponenting. They're saying, hey, we've got to live by the law. It's our righteousness. We have to obey. We have to obey. But they are bypassing Christ and the Spirit of God who gives us the power to obey the Word of God. And Paul is talking about that in verse 12. But on human hearts, such confidence we have through Christ toward God. And when we get to this verse 12, we do not pick up on this confidence coming from Christ. What he's saying is this attitude from these from the outside, and it's also causing some problems with you, you're having a confidence in self and not in a confidence in the power of God. And so now Paul is going to work through for the rest to the end of the chapter of 10, he's going to work through right measurements. How do we measure spiritual ministry? It's a good question. It's a good thing to ponder because that's what we're called to is spiritual ministry. The Lord has left us here to be spiritual ambassadors of him. We have to be dependent on the spirit of God. We're in a war. So how do we measure this? How do I walk this out? And there's three questions that I think will help us. And the first one we're going to apply to verse 13 and 14. Am I where God wants me to be? It's a good question. It's a good question when you're analyzing maybe, you know, I worked in children's ministry, but I'm sensing maybe I need to do something else. That's a good question. Sometimes we're afraid to ask that question because we really don't want the answer. Because sometimes we just get used to doing things. And so Paul here is saying no, We need to be in in touch with the Spirit of God, and we need to be asking that question of ourselves. And here's what Paul says. He says, but we will not be boast beyond our measure, but within the measure of the sphere which God apportioned to us as a measure to reach even as far as you. So what Paul's saying is we were given an allotment, we were given a place. The thought there is he uses the word sphere. And the word sphere means stick to your own lane. It's a word that they use for racing. Remember Corinth had the Isthmus games? And so when you're going to get ready to run, you are allotted a lane to run in. And if you don't stay in that lane, you disqualify yourself from the race. And so Paul's here saying, I've been given a sphere from the Lord. My sphere is not your sphere. So quit worrying about this person's sphere and pay attention to your sphere. What are you called to do? We spend so much time worrying about what everyone else is doing that we forget that we have a personal ministry, we have a gift that's given to us, and we have a measure that is given to us, and we need to stick to our lane. And Paul's saying, I did that as an apostle. I'm not going to go where God hasn't called me to go. I'm going to stick to that, that lane. And he uses the word measure like six times. It's the word metron. It means kind of a, a, a lane or a, a space or how to, how to measure something, how to, how to analyze something. And so the question here is, am I where God wants me to be? And there's a couple thoughts here that I, I want to give to you. The first question is, and the first thought is, are you listening to God? Go to the Lord Am I listening? In 1 Samuel 3.10, Samuel began to hear from the Lord. And he didn't recognize it. He didn't know what it was. And sometimes we don't. Sometimes it takes us back. So I think Paul's leaving room. He understands gifting. But here's the issue. In in 1 Samuel 3.10, it says, Then the Lord came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel. 
and Samuel said. So God's end is Samuel, Samuel. But he's not going to do the next part for us. And here's what Samuel said. Speak, for your servant is listening. Speak, for your servant is listening. And the question we have to ask ourselves, especially us that have been believers for a long time, is am I listening to the Lord? Have I gotten out of my lane? Do I even know what my lane is? Do I know what measure there is? Am I even involved in his kingdom? Am I a spectator or am I a player? Am I on the field? Do I, do, do I, am I experiencing the Lord? Because these Judaizers are coming in and analyzing and trying to pick these believers apart and they need to focus on what God has called them to do. Not boasting beyond our measure, that is, in other men's labors, but with the hope that as your faith grows, we will be within our sphere, enlarged even more by you. So the second thing that I think is helpful for us is not my will, but yours, Lord. Now, who taught us that? Who if that was, if our Lord Jesus Christ submitted to the Father, then where does that put us? Now, Jesus was in the garden, and he says this in Matthew 26, 39. And he went a little while beyond, beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not I, not as I will, but as you will. And what Jesus is saying there is, I'm going to submit to the sphere, the lane that you have given me. And I'm going to submit myself to it, and I'm not going to assume, do I want this cup to pass? Lord, if it's possible, if it's possible, but Lord, here I am. And as I was reading this, it was a, it was a really good thing to stick back, sit back and say, Lord, where, is, where am I at? If you asked me to do something, would I do it? If you challenged what I was doing, would I turn? Would I complain? What would I do? If you tapped me on the shoulder, would you find me in a place of softness and willingness? Or am I hard and fast in what I'm doing? Because that's what, was hap that was what Paul is trying to prevent. He's saying, don't be hard and fast, but be willing. Be willing. The second question, there's a second question. Is God glorified by my ministry? Is God glorified by my ministry? We have a ministry. We have a service unto God. As Romans 12, 1 through 2 says. Our spiritual worship, our lives that means you go to work, that's spiritual worship. What are you doing with that sphere that God has given you? Is God glorified by my ministry? Notice what he says in 15. Not boasting beyond our measure, that is, in other men's labors, but with the hope that as your faith grows, as your faith grows, that's, that's a test there. Paul's saying, okay, God in your ministry is faith growing. Do you notice faith growing? Is your own faith growing? Are you growing in trust or are you growing in comfort? Are the people around you growing in their faith? There's two ways to think about that faith. One is a doctrinal. Are you growing in the faith? Are people coming to a true knowledge of Jesus Christ? Are they loving his word more? But there's also this thought of, are you growing in your faith? Are you applying it? Are people applying it around you? Or are you just dancing and passing the buck? And we're talking about it, and we're talking about it, and we're talking about it, but no one's really growing. And that's easy to do. And Paul's saying, that's not happening. People are being saved. The word of God is going out. The gospel is going out. Because what does he say? We, we will be within our sphere enlarged even more by you. So as to preach the gospel even to the regions beyond you. And not to boast in what has been accomplished in another man's sphere. 
Do you notice in the ministry that you're in that hearts are being enlarged? The thought there is koinonia. Is koinonia happening? Is there an enlargement of the heart happening? Paul's been dealing with the Corinthians. His heart is wide open to them. Their heart has been a little standoffish. But that's not what God wants to do in ministry. God wants to open up the heart. Is that happening? Is that happening in your ministry? If it isn't, maybe God's trying to get your attention. Maybe it is time. Maybe it's time to shift in a sphere. Maybe it's time that, Lord, what are you doing in my heart? But also he says that the gospel is going to the regions beyond you. With Paul, the great commission, the gospel, the lost were never far from his mind. The lost. We are here for the sake of the lost. The lost. Are the lost, are, are, are people stretching out? Are we going out? Are we engaging the lost in our ministry? Is God in, in your ministry, are the lost being engaged? Really? Because if they're not, then we're not really following what God's called us to. And Paul is reminding the Corinthians of that. Is God really glorified by my ministry. And a third thing is glory in God and not human accolades. But he who boasts in the Lord, he who boasts is to boast in the Lord. For it is not he who commends himself that is approved, but he whom the Lord commends. We're called to glory in God and not human accolades, which is a propensity of the Corinthians because of the culture that they lived in. We talked about that last week. They, it's not that being intellectual is wrong, but when your intellectualism lofts you above the knowledge of God and above the submission to God, your intellectualism has become a God, has become a God. And you're at the center of it. And it's controlling you. You're not controlling it. We think we are. That's the the subtlety of an idol. Whatever you worship, you become. And it controls you. And that's why Paul will say, be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't be drunk with wine. Is it wrong to drink? No, but it's wrong to have it control you. We're not supposed to have anything control us but the Holy Spirit. And so Paul's saying, in this sphere, I'm being controlled and I want to boast in the Lord. Remember that Jesus is the hero. In fact, Paul quotes part of Jeremiah 9, 23. He says this, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, and let not the mighty man boast of his might. And let not the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises loving kindness, justice, and righteousness on the earth. For I delight in these things, declares the Lord. Jesus is the hero. Jesus is the hero. If Jesus is not center in your ministry, then you don't have ministry. He's the hero. He's the one. And we have to constantly be adjusting ourselves back to who he is. That's part of what we're called to do. We're the runners. We need to adjust to the lane that we are in. God is not going to adjust us for ourselves. We need to cooperate with him and adjust. The third question is, can the Lord commend your work? So what was happening is these Judaizers were coming with letters of recommendation and other preachers were coming and they were saying, we got the credentials. Paul doesn't have anything. We have the credentials. And they were pushing themselves forward. The thought there is, can, can the Lord commend your work or are you commending your work? Are you pushing your work? 
that is absolutely going to take time to sit before the Lord and figure that out. Remember, how do we know that the Lord commended Paul's work? Understand, Paul was commended in his work through trials, through difficulties, through beatings, through sufferings, and through a lot of change. Oh, did he say change? What's the, what's the old adage in a church? We never did that before. <laughs> so what? <laughs> it's the Lord's church. And Paul dealt with that. Remember, Paul wanted to go in one place. The Lord said, no, I'm going to close that door. And Paul was a Pharisee. He was used to being in charge. He let the knowledge come through his mechanism, and God changed that. And so, can God commend our work? It's God who pushed it forward. Remember, Paul came to Corinth. He said, I came in fear and trembling. And I was amongst you, and I didn't glory in smooth talking and persuasive word, but I relied on a demonstration of the Spirit and power. If we go back to Acts, we see that when Paul got to Corinth, it didn't go real well right away. And Paul was really shaking, and Paul was struggling, and Paul wanted to leave. Paul wanted to go ahead and move forward. What did he had right before Corinth? He'd had Athens, and he only stayed there for three or four days, and it didn't go that great. By human standards. By human standards, it didn't. And Paul's kind of thinking the same thing, and the Lord says, no, Paul, stay. I have people here for you. I'm with you. I have people here. Who did Paul, who did Paul meet there? Prisca and Aquila. And they helped Paul. They were tent makers, and they helped Paul. And Paul stayed there a year and a half. Imagine if Paul had said, you know, I think I know better. I'm just going to go ahead and move. What would have happened? What would have happened? Well, Paul would have missed out on a lot, for sure. We need to land, landing where we need to stay. So as Paul moves into chapter 11, and I didn't want to stop at the end of chapter 10, because the thought keeps going forward, that he brings them back to where they need to land, and where they need to stay. Paul does it all the time. It's the sandwich principle. Problem, it, it start with Christ, deal with the problem, end with Christ. It's a beautiful sandwich. And that's what Paul does here. And so what Paul says here is, I wish that you bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. Paul's going back and forth. We're about in a five-year history with this church. For I am jealous with you, for you with a godly jealousy, for I betrothed you to one husband. The thought there is Paul is the bridegroom taking care of the bride for the groom. And Paul here, his stewardship is to cultivate and shepherd this church and prepare them for Jesus because the church is his bride. And we are being prepared Every tongue, every tribe, every nation will be the bride of Christ and we will be presented to Jesus. And Paul here is saying, I presented you to Christ, don't drift off of him. Be pure in your devotion to him. He brought them to Christ. His motivation, you can go there, we won't go there right now, in Galatians 4, 16 through 19, he actually talks about, I labored with you that Christ might be formed in you. And Paul desires for Christ to be shaped in them, in them, that I might present you as a pure virgin. I think sometimes we don't realize that when we're saved, we no longer live for ourselves. Everything changes. Now we've been betrothed to Christ. I'm his first. I'm his first over my kids, over my wife, over my church. Over everything. I am Christ's. I am Christ's first. He is my husband. He is my protector. When everyone else fails, and it will happen, we will fail each other in marriage, unfortunately. We will stumble as a church. 
You will be forsaken. You will go through difficulties. But your first husband, Jesus Christ, will never leave you. And so he's saying, I betrothed you to the one who is your husband, who loves you and cares for you. And then he brings up, how did we get in this mess? Remember, when Paul came to Corinth, he didn't have the New Testament. He had the Old Testament. And by, I will tell you, he definitely shared the garden with them. He definitely shared Genesis and the thought of Adam and Eve. He writes about it in his letters all the time. And so what does he talk about here? He talks about a garden. He talks about perfection. He talks about a plan. He talks about a scheme. He talks about a rebellion. He talks about a promise. And he finally presents a redeemer. That's what he does. And here's what he says. For if it, he says, For I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, did God really say you're going to die? Really? Did God really say this? Satan used half-truths. He doesn't just come with a full-blown lie. He comes with a half-truth. And he tries to get you to pivot off of Christ a little bit. And we go, well, a little bit. But what you don't realize is a couple years later, you're way off track. And this church has gotten off track. And they took their eyes off of God. Adam and Eve, they took their eyes off of God. What, what happened? What was the rebellion? God, I know better than you. I know what to do with my life. I want to be like you. I'm not going to submit to you. I'm going to do this. And what happens? They bite into the scheme. And where did that scheme come from? It came from Satan, who was not able and was not pleased with the position that God gave him. He wanted to be like God. And Satan always deceives with the lie that he believes the most. And the lie that he believed the most was, I want to be like you. I want to be number one. I want people to worship me. And so they took themselves out of that place of submission to God. And their minds will be led astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. The thought there is, when he says simplicity and devotion and purity to Christ, it means single-mindedness. What does Satan try to do? He tries to divide you. What, is, what does Satan try to do to a body? He tries to divide it. He wants to divide things. He wants to divide things. He comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And Paul's saying, no, we must have a united heart to Christ. And I led you, your minds are going to go astray. They're going to become divided. And what happens is you drift off astray from the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Love and fidelity to him. Jesus Christ, that's exactly what Satan tried to get Jesus to do when he tempted him. He tried to get him from simplicity and devotion to the Father. He tried to get him off plan. And Jesus said, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to dazzle. I'm not going to razzle. I'm not going to do any of that. I'm going to stay devoted to my Father for the sake of them. And that's why we have a garden, perfection, a plan, a scheme, a rebellion. We have rebelled against God. You can't be changed unless you realize your need. We have rebelled, and there's a promise, and there's finally a redeemer. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you for your word. I want to thank you for your goodness. I want to thank you that you are a great redeemer and that you care for us. As we sing this song, Lord, knowing you, knowing you, being known, there's no greater thing. There's nothing like being betrothed to you who will never leave us nor forsake us. 
Help us in this time to let you examine our hearts, to turn to you, to cry out to you, to not let this time pass when you want to do business in our hearts and our minds. In Jesus' name, amen.